Hello class, welcome to the final segment in lecture six. And in this segment, we're going to talk a little bit about friction and some of the physical consequences that arise from including friction or factoring friction into our atmospheric equations of motion. And this is actually going to be sort of a starter segment. In the next lecture, we'll actually sort of pick up where we left off on the end of this lecture and sort of continue our discussion about physical consequences. But for now, I'm mainly gonna focus on just a brief introduction to friction and also just a brief introduction on some of the physical consequences that we can see from the force of friction. So with that, we'll go ahead and get right into it. So friction, typically the most general definition of friction is any sort of force that resists motion. But when we're working with the atmosphere, we're more specifically talking about a drag force that resists motion. That is the, you can sort of think of it as just air resistance. It's just the the air around you is trying to resist uh, stuff moving through it. So there's a force of friction involved that's trying to impede any sort of flow. There's just air in the there's just air moving towards air. Air is getting in the way of air, and it wants to slow down the air. And if that makes no sense at all, don't worry about it. We'll talk about this in greater depth and greater detail. And uh, one other point that's kind of important to make about friction is, and this is something that we mentioned when we we're talking about the geostrophic wind. And that is that friction is typically strongest in the lowest one to two kilometers of the atmosphere. Sometimes it's especially strong even in the lowest three kilometers of the atmosphere. And that region, of, that region of the atmosphere actually has its own special name, and that's referred to as the atmospheric boundary layer, ABL, or the planetary boundary layer, or PBL. And we'll talk more about the atmospheric boundary layer in some distant lectures in the distant future. But for now, just keep in mind that force of friction is typically strongest in the lowest one, two, sometimes even three kilometers of the atmosphere. And we typically refer to that as the atmospheric boundary layer. And we'll also sort of explore some causes of friction. Uh, some are more relevant than others when we're working in meteorology. Uh, one of which is intermolecular forces. And uh, some of you may remember from chemistry classes that intermolecular forces are things like uh, hydrogen bonds, uh, London disturbance, dispersion forces, that is, uh, forces that want to pull or, or want to attract or repel individual molecules from each other. Another cause of friction is just molecular diffusion, diffusion that is, as air parcels expand, they encounter more of a drag force, and that tends to slow them down, that tends to create a larger force of friction. These are mostly on the molecular level or the microscopic level, so we usually don't like to worry about those because those are really easy. Those are really difficult to quantify and also really difficult to observe. So it's really hard matching theory to observation when we're working with these two really, really small scale forces. However, a couple of things that we can actually model and get some verification for is turbulence, and also the next point that we'll introduce. But turbulence is just any sort of non-uniform motion that's resulting in air colliding with itself. And usually this is in the form of specifically turbulent eddies, which is just, uh, usually you can think of, it, think of that as just rolling uh, rolling pockets of air that create sort of a, create some impedance, impedance or just sort of a barrier that tries to block the flow of air around it. And we'll talk more about that when we get into the planetary boundary layer. But also something to keep in mind is surface roughness. So one of the reasons why the force of friction is so strong in the lowest one to two kilometers of the atmosphere is the fact that you can have topography or a landscape that is also producing a barrier that impedes the flow of uh, the fluid in the boundary layer or in the lowest one to two kilometers. And a lot of times that's in the form of mountains, but you can also get some uh, impeding of the flow from uh, d densely forested or vegetated landscapes, but also urban landscapes. In particular, uh, large downtown areas where you have lots of skyscrapers that are uh, impeding the flow as the air is trying to go through the downtown area of a major city. And as far as we're concerned, turbulence and surface roughness are the two things that we're going to worry about the most, are the four factors that we're given here. And the reason why is because those are the ones that we can more easily observe and more easily quantify and more easily think about. So one thing that I'm going to introduce is how to quantify friction. Now, there's a couple of ways to do this. One is shear stress parameter, which is what we're going to look at in just a few seconds. There is another way to quantify friction, and that's using the air resistance equation, which any physics student that has seen the air resistance equation knows how that can make things really complicated because you have a linear term and a quadratic term, and sometimes you can neglect one or the other, but if you can't neglect either of them, then it gets really complicated. But if that makes no sense, don't worry about it because we're not going to worry about air resistance in this class, but when you get to cloud physics, you will have to worry about air resistance a little bit. But 
Just keep in mind that does exist, but the main thing that we're going to focus on here is something called a shear stress parameter, which is defined something like so. So that's uh, tau sub s vector is equal to minus rho times c sub d times v vector times the magnitude of v. And there's not a whole lot of symbols here that we haven't seen before. So one of which is just density, which is represented by rho. And this makes sense, right? Because if you've got a really dense fluid, like not necessarily air, you can even think about water. If you've ever tried running in water in say a pool or on a beach, you'll know it's almost impossible because there's just so much resistance from how dense that water is. Water is many times more dense than air is. So it's much harder to run through water than it is through air. And you get tired a lot more quickly if you try to run through water. So that makes sense. If you have a denser fluid, then you're going to have a stronger force of friction. And shear stress parameter is a way of quantifying how strong the friction is. Now, this other term we have here, C sub D, isn't something that we've seen yet. That is, in fact, the drag coefficient. And that takes into account how aerodynamic the ambient flow pattern is. And just to sort of give you a bearing on how that works, Consider, say, a case as shown here on the left-hand side where you have a nice aerodynamic flow pattern where the air can easily pass around the obstacle without encountering too much resistance. So that's a very aerodynamic flow pattern, so that means that there's less drag, and that gives you a smaller value for your drag coefficient, C sub D. So if your flow is very, very aerodynamic, then C sub D is very small. If your flow is not aerodynamic, such as the case that's on the right here, that means you have more drag, that means you have more friction, more impeding of the flow, and that means you have a stronger or a larger drag coefficient C sub D here. So C sub D just takes into account how aerodynamic the flow is. If it's very aerodynamic, then C sub D is small, which makes sense. Small C sub D means less friction, which means more aerodynamic. Less aerodynamic means more friction, which means larger uh, drag coefficient C sub D. And then also, it's proportional to the velocity of the flow itself. And this is not a linear dependency. This is, in fact, a quadratic dependency. The force of friction is proportional to the square of the velocity vector itself, because we have the velocity vector times its magnitude here. So that means if you increase the, if you say double the velocity of the fluid, you will actually increase the force of friction by a factor of four. So that's something that kind of arises from that quadratic dependency. If you double velocity, you will, in fact, increase the force of friction by a factor of four. And I'll go ahead and pose this question again. Why the negative sign? Why do we have this negative sign out in front here? Even pause the video and take a few seconds to think about why we have a negative sign there. So hopefully you remember the same question that was asked in lecture two when we introduced the pressure gradient force, because the answer is pretty much the same. The reason why we have the negative sign is because our force of friction points in the opposite direction of our velocity vector. So if our velocity vector were pointing from west to east, that means that the force of friction must point from east to west, because by definition, friction must oppose the flow. It must impede the flow. And the only way that can work mathematically is if the friction, the force of friction vector, points in the opposite direction of the velocity vector. So that's where this negative sign comes, comes in. It's just a nice way of keeping everything mathematically consistent, which states that if our velocity vector is pointing one way, then the force of friction must be pointing in the opposite direction. So again, that's our shear stress parameter. But another parameter that we like to use is this parameter right here, which is defined as minus 1 over rho times the change in our shear stress parameter with height. And this primarily depends on the vertical gradient. This is another way of quantifying uh, the force of friction. Uh, if I remember correctly, that's, this is primarily used to assess the uh, how much turbulence would be offered by, say, a turbulent eddy. So that's primarily what this is accounting for. This is just air resistance, more or less just air resistance, and this is just uh, friction caused by turbulent eddies. And that primarily depends on the vertical gradient in our shear stress parameter. So if our shear stress parameter changes very rapidly with height, then we're going to have more friction caused by... Uh, this factor f sub s here. And as you get above the boundary layer, this basically goes to zero. The shear stress parameter changes very, very little as you go from, say, one height to the next. It's very, very small. But once you get really, as you get really close to the ground, the shear stress parameter does change very rapidly. So you get a lot of friction due to turbulent eddies in the boundary layer. And we'll talk more about the boundary layer in later lectures. And because friction is complicated, 
understatement of the year right there. Friction is complicated. When we go to actually perform calculations, we like to just disregard friction altogether because it just really complicates our life. If we can ignore friction, then we definitely want to when we do something, do any sort of calculations, but sometimes that's just not possible. So again, remember one of the caveats we mentioned for geostrophic wind, you cannot use geostrophic balance if friction is very strong because again, friction is very important because it can in fact slow down the flow significantly. And that's one of the reasons why the winds in the lowest one kilometer of the atmosphere are so weak is because friction is so strong versus once you get in the upper atmosphere, say around 500 millibars, the winds get a lot stronger and that's partly due to the fact that there's less friction up there. Now, I do want to go ahead and take a look at, this is mostly a conceptual overview, but there is a very significant physical consequence that arises when we include friction in our equations of motion. So let's consider a nice simple case where we have an air parcel given by this large black dot moving to the east. So velocity points from west to east. That means the Coriolis force must point from uh, north to south, and the pressure gradient force points from south to north. So this is like a this is basically geostrophic balance without friction. But now we're going to add friction into our diagram here, represented by this gold arrow. Now, if we introduce friction into our uh, our system here, that means that we're going to have flow that's going to be slowing down because when we introduce friction, that means that our velocity is going to be reduced by some factor. It might be by a half, it might be more than that. But the key point is when we add friction in here, this is going to slow down our velocity vector. And if our velocity vector slows down, that also means force of friction slows down as well. But the main thing that I want to focus on is the fact that the velocity vector here is in fact being slowed down by the force of friction. However, you may remember from the Coriolis force uh, lecture that the Coriolis force is dependent on the velocity of the object in question or the velocity of the air parcel. So if we reduce our velocity here, that means that the Coriolis force must also weaken because if V is smaller, if the wind is smaller, then the Coriolis force must also be smaller, must also be weaker. And if our Coriolis force is weaker now, we don't, have a pr we don't have a force balance anymore. We have a Coriolis force that's weak and a pressure gradient force that's relatively strong. So that means that the wind now wants to accelerate in the direction the pressure gradient force vector points. So again, just to reiterate that, if, the Coriolis for if we have a balance between pressure gradient force and Coriolis force, and then our Coriolis force is weakened, that means now we have an acceleration that points in the direction of the pressure gradient force because this pressure gradient force is now stronger than the Coriolis force. So now the net force is non-zero. So now we have an acceleration that goes in the direction of the pressure gradient force. And that ultimately causes our wind vector to look something like this. So now we have, instead of a wind vector that's flowing perfectly parallel to the isobars, now we have a wind vector that's crossing isobars. It's moving towards areas of lower pressure. As when we entered, And that again is ultimately due to the fact that we introduced friction in here. Because friction weakened our wind, which weakened our Coriolis force which caused our pressure gradient force to dominate, which caused the wind to move in the direction of the pressure gradient force, just to sort of summarize everything that was just mentioned. And I'll also go ahead and say, make sure you understand the logic behind all of this, because at the beginning of next lecture, we're going to take this diagram and heavily expand on it to show another physical consequence of friction. But you might already have an idea of what that might be, but we'll actually explore it in greater depth in the next lecture.